So hi everyone. Just as we're getting people joining us, I just want to say a big welcome to the UCD Engineering Your Future at Home webinar today. My name is Laura Egan O'Brien. I'm the UCD College of Engineering and Architecture Marketing Manager. Um, we were really disappointed that we couldn't run our normal on-campus event for Engineering Your Future this year, but it's actually worked out not too bad because we can reach a much wider audience uh, by doing an online event today. Um, just uh, before we get started, some housekeeping. Uh, for the best viewing experience, you want to make sure that your screen is in speaker view mode, which if it's not already, you can toggle using the uh, button at the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, and then throughout the event today, if you have any questions that you want to ask us, there is a Q&A button in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just type your questions in there. We might leave it towards the end of the webinar today to actually answer the questions, um, just because we probably maybe answer some of the questions during the presentations today. Um, also, just to let you know, we are recording the webinar today and we're going to pop that up on our YouTube channel maybe next week. So if you miss anything or want to revisit it at any stage, um, it could be there for you to, to have a watch. Um, and then lastly, just to let you know, we are going to be running a competition today uh, so you can win a UCD uh, engineering goodie bag, which features a UCD engineering hoodie and a 50 euro Just Eat voucher. So if you want a chance to win that, I'll tell you about how to enter um, at the end of the session today. So make sure you tune in until the end. Um, and then schedule wise, we're gonna hear from Kate Cannon, who is from Steps Engineers Ireland program. Um, we're also going to be uh, hearing from myself with a, an overview of our engineering program, uh, what the kind of degree structure is like. Then you're gonna get a uh, sample lecture from Dr. Colin Kyo, who is gonna cover disruptive technologies, also from Dr. Philip Donnellan, who is going to talk about renewable energies. And then last but not least, we're also going to have a Q&A session with two of our current students, which would be really great for you to ask any questions at that stage that you might have. Um, so I think we'll get started. Uh, so first up is Kate Cannon, as I mentioned, from Steps Engineers Ireland program. And Kate has some slides, so I'm going to share those now, and then Kate's going to just have a quick word with you. Thanks, Laura. So as Laura mentioned, uh, I work for the STEPS team in NGOs <laughs> Ireland and many of you have been in touch with me um, regarding the Engineering Your Future programme. You probably applied for it this year, which is probably why you've heard about this webinar today. So as you know, unfortunately, most of the programmes that were planned for this year have, were cancelled. Just to tell you about us, so we're the outreach programme that we want to promote engineering as a future career to students. And the main programs that we have that are of interest for your age group are the Engineers Week and Engineering Your Future. So Engineers Week will go ahead next March, um, the, the first week in March as planned, and Engineering Your Future will go ahead next year. We're waiting for dates for that. Um, and this, this webinar, I suppose, is a taste of what Engineering Your Future in UCD would have been like this year. We also have some uh, videos on our website and as Laura mentioned, the video of this webinar will be on our website from next week as well. So the STEPS Engineering Your Future program is just, in, it's designed as a hands-on experience, which unfortunately you won't get today, but you will get um, an interactive experience with a Q&A session. And you will find out a lot about what engineering is like in third level. So uh, as I mentioned, there were 18 programs planned this year. Five of them did take place. And the remaining ones uh, were cancelled this year, but we're hoping to have a full uh, set of 18 or maybe even more for 2021. If, if you're aware of anyone who's going into transition year next year, they can sign up. Um, so basically, if you want to find out more, you can look at our website. We are sponsored by um, a number of industry partners and also SFI. Um, so the sponsorship details are there. And that's our website, engineersireland.ie. You can go to the school section for more information. And if you want to contact us directly, the steps at engineersireland.ie is the best email address. So just want to thank UCD so much for today. Uh, this is a fantastic webinar, which you know is reaching a huge audience and will reach a bigger audience when it's online as well. So thank you so much. Great, thanks very much, uh, Kate. Um, and also just to show you on screen, we also have my colleague Katie O'Neill here, um, and she's going to join us for the Q&A session uh, later on today. Um, so thank you very much to Kate and to Katie. As well. um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of our engineering uh, programme now. If you just bear with me, share my screen with you. 
Hi, my name is Laura Egan O'Brien. I'm the UCD College of Engineering and Architecture Market Manager, and I'm going to give you an overview of the UCD Engineering Programme. Choosing to do engineering in UCD is a great option, and there are many reasons why. We provide a world-class engineering education from leading academics. We're in the top 1% of universities in the world, and many of our academics are leaders in their field. We have one of the widest range of degree courses in Ireland. Students can choose to do civil engineering, structural engineering with architecture, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical electronic engineering, or chemical and bioprocess engineering. Many of our degrees are also accredited by the relevant professional bodies. This is really good for students who are looking to get chartership after they finish their degree, or maybe want to work outside of Ireland. In the third year of the programme, engineering students have the option to study abroad or Erasmus. This means that for either six months or a full academic year, students can choose to study in one of our partner institutions somewhere in the world. In the past, students have chosen to go to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US or mainland Europe. This is a great opportunity, not just academically, but also as a life experience with students being able to live in a different country, experience the culture and make new friends. For students on the five-year engineering programme, there's also the opportunity in their fourth year to do a six to eight month professional work experience. This is a great opportunity for students to put what they learn in the classroom into practice. And many companies use this as an extended interview with students securing jobs for when they finish their degree. We have two internship managers within the college who build up relationship with these companies and help you prepare for this internship. The Career Development Centre is also open to students to do mock interviews, CV clinics and workshops. For students who also have academic interests outside of engineering, there's the UCD Horizons programme. This means that for a couple of classes every year, students can choose subjects from around the university. Students may choose to pursue things like languages, zoology, archaeology, art history. This is great to make students more well-rounded, but also for job opportunities in the future. UCD Engineering also has excellent employment prospects with great links with industry. UCD also has a lot of supports available to our students, from student advisors to peer mentors, the Writing Support Centre, and maybe most applicable for our engineering students, the Math Support Centre. And while the main reason our students come to UCD is to get a great degree, we also want students to experience college life. And that's where UCD clubs and societies come in. A lot of our engineering students choose to join the UCD Engineering Society, Women in STEM, UCD formula student, go away with UCD volunteers overseas. There's also clubs for every kind of sport and societies like Harry Potter, chess, drama, music, film, whatever you're interested in. So for students who know engineering is what they want to do, how do you get into the course? So for the majority of our Irish students, they'll typically come in by doing the leaving cert and applying through the CAO system. The code you need for the CAO is DN150. And for students who came in in 2019, the minimum points requirement was 511 points. So to close, we're going to need students to present with English, Irish, maths at a H4, and a science subject at a H6. And this can be chemistry, physics, biology, or agricultural science. And then two other recognized subjects. For our EU students who are coming through the CAO system, we're presenting with A-levels or maybe the International Baccalaureate, you can find the requirements on our UC admissions website. And then for our non-EU international students, you can find out the minimum entry requirements by going to our UC global website. The structure of our engineering degree means there are multiple decision points along the way, and that students can explore their options before they have to make these choices. The first year of the program is a common engineering year with students studying fundamentals in maths and science, which is really important for engineering. And it's also good to get everyone up to the same uh, standard from their second level education. Students then get to do introductory modules in basic engineering principles, things like intro to mechanics, energy engineering, biomedical sciences, computer science for engineers, intro to civil and environmental engineering, or creativity and design. At the end of first year, before going into second year, students choose their pathway that they'd like to specialize in for the rest of the degree. Students can choose one of six pathways. As I mentioned, we offer civil engineering, structural engineering with architecture, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical and bioprocess engineering, and electronic and electrical engineering. 
towards the end of second year is when students choose if they want to go on their Erasmus or study abroad in their third year. And then at the end of third year, students choose if they're going to do the four year Bachelor of Engineering or they'll complete it for their two years and finish with both the Bachelor and the Masters of Engineering as part of our full five year programme. And as I said before, if students choose the full five year programme with us, they get the opportunity to, to do that six to eight month internship in their fourth year. So for students want to know a little bit more about what the different disciplines of engineering actually mean, I'll explain a little here. Civil engineers are involved with the building and construction industry. They're also involved in building transport infrastructure, water and waste infrastructure, and planning. Another big area for civil engineering that's maybe a little less obvious is the area of sustainable development and environmental engineering. Civil engineers are looking at how we meet the needs of society into the future and how we do that in a sustainable way while also looking after the environment. Then we have structural engineering with architecture. This is similar to civil engineering, but with a much greater emphasis on structures, things like buildings and bridges. Students in this area will also take classes with our architectural programme and learn how to appreciate aesthetics of buildings and also to learn about the architectural design process. Biomedical engineering uses traditional engineering methods to solve problems in healthcare. And biomedical engineers work very closely with healthcare professionals. They improve biological and medical outcomes, advance healthcare, work on medical devices and instruments. And this is a huge area in Ireland. So there's great job opportunities. Mechanical engineering is the broadest of the engineering disciplines that we offer here in UCD. It covers everything from design, manufacturing, testing and operation of components, and it feeds into many industries such as aerospace, automotive, robotics, medical technologies, and the energy sector. Electrical engineering focuses on the use of electricity and focuses on the generation, transmission, and storage of this electricity, and is particularly concerned at the moment in renewable energies, things like wind and solar. Whereas electronic engineers design circuits and systems, they focus on hardware and aspects of software and programming that underpin digital communication, the internet, smartphones, and digital media. And last but not least, chemical and bioprocess engineering. This stream of engineering looks at how to transform chemicals and materials into other useful products and how to realize this on a large scale for production. Chemical engineers do this for many industries, including the pharmaceutical industry, the food and drinks industry, and also the oil and gas industry. Now, what kind of careers can you have as an engineering graduate? Career-wise, engineering is very broad and varied, so it follows suit that the careers would also be. Our graduates are finishing with transferable skills and a mindset that works for a multitude of different industries. We find some students go to work in more traditional and typical engineering roles in industries and sectors like ICT sector, the energy sector, manufacturing, medical technology companies and pharmaceutical companies. And then we have students who maybe go the less obvious route into financial services, banking, professional services and consultancy. Others are more entrepreneurial and may wish to start their own companies. Students work in companies sized anywhere from a startup right up to the large multinationals like Google and Facebook. We also have a smaller cohort of students who may wish to pursue further studies, maybe a research master's or PhD, and ultimately they want to go into research or academia. So it really is a very flexible and practical degree that affords a lot of opportunities to our graduates. It can take you a lot of different places and you really can't go wrong with the degree in engineering. Thank you for listening and if you want to reach out to us or find out more about life on campus, don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. Next speaker, which is Philip Donnellan, who is from our School of uh, Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering. And his kind of sample lecture is all around um, renewable energy availability and the challenges and opportunities that that, that, that affords. I'm just going to launch that while you do the poll. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Donnellan. So as Laura said, I'm a lecturer in chemical engineering. Um, and yeah, so my, my talk today is going to be very much around the idea of renewable energy. Um, really important, obviously, aspect of our everyday lives, something we come across all the time, we hear about a lot. But I suppose the purpose of the talk is to maybe just give that kind of engineering perspective on it in terms of as an engineer, or if you were an engineer, what would this challenge look like for you? Um, and where maybe some of the potential opportunities um, for actually getting involved and making a difference. So I suppose the, the general concept um, of introducing why we need to worry about renewable energy isn't something that needs a huge amount of introduction. 
Um, we're all extremely aware that we're in a race against time at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, it's not one we're winning. So we just need to make sure that we ultimately act quickly, act decisively, and get to a point where we have a sustainable energy cycle, which allows us to obtain all the energy which we need, but also means that we're not having a detrimental impact on our planet and upon uh, our planet's future. So uh, with that said, um, this is just a very brief kind of um, overview in terms of maybe some of the different uh, areas which we get uh, our energy sources from. Not going into detail on this, but looking at it, we can see that ultimately the majority of our energy still does come from fossil fuel sources. So again, with fossil fuels, we're talking about anything that I suppose we're digging out of the ground, long hydrocarbon chains, oil, gas, natural uh, oil, natural gas, uh, coal, and even we peat on this. So these are all um, energy sources which are developed over millions of years um, and which are available to us now. But the problem, of course, is when we burn them, we emit carbon dioxide, which we know is uh, greenhouse gas and which is going to um, continue having that detrimental impact, which we said we don't want. So what we want is more renewable energy, right? So renewable energy is something, again, we, we see all the time, but the kind of questions are like, what are the main places which we can get it from? And the most obvious one across the world, maybe sometimes not in Ireland, but across the world, is solar energy. So if you look at a sustainable energy culture, ultimately, at the very pinnacle of it all, it all comes from solar energy. Our, our Earth's energy source is the sun. Okay? Uh, other things that happen are all kind of derivatives of it, but ultimately the sun is what powers the earth. So if the sun is what powers the earth, then why don't we use that to directly power our everyday lives? And that's what solar energy is. So just in a very brief, very brief kind of overview. So in the top left-hand side here, we have just a kind of schematic of a solar energy panel. And again, what these are, traditionally, these have typically been thin layers of silicone. Um, and what happens is the sun energy hits the, hits the top of the silicone panel. And that energy hitting the panel is the same as the energy hitting your arm. You can feel the energy as it impacts. And that impact upon the silicone uh, panel, what it does is it releases electrons. These electrons then um, basically can flow from one side of the panel to the other. So they flow through like a circuit as we've drawn here. And ultimately, if you have electrons flowing through a circuit, that's electricity. So the sun releases the electrons in the solar uh, panel material. And those electrons then get to flow around in the circuit, creating our electrical energy, which is what we want. Okay, so if that's solar energy, and we know that we have so much solar energy available to us, um, how do we actually start harnessing it? And like the traditional view has been, or the traditional thing that we might see has been what we have here in the bottom right hand side, which is big, long uh, solar farms, if you like, which consist of these rigid solar panels. Um, and again, these work, they're fine. The problem is, and the problem we don't have more and more of these, is that ultimately you can see they take up a huge amount of space. And at the end of the day, they're also very, very expensive. So they're, they're not cheap to, to manufacture and to buy. So from an engineering perspective, you can say, well, okay, that's the problem. What's our solution? And the solution that's currently being worked on, which well, obviously this is one of many, many solutions. Solar energy is a huge, huge area. But one of the solutions is to say, well, okay, well, the problem is that they're taking up a huge amount of space and that they're very rigid and expensive. Can we make them a lot thinner, a lot smaller, a lot more flexible, and a lot cheaper? So on the bottom right, left hand side here, you can see that we essentially have like a solar panel film, if you like, or a little thin membrane that's completely flexible and pliable. So first of all, just intuitively, that on the bottom left looks a lot cheaper than that on the bottom right, and you would be correct, it is. But also what it allows is it allows really innovative kind of solutions like what we have here, where we can, this is a Scandinavian house, where they've actually covered their roof in this kind of flexible solar um, cell membrane. So that means we're taking up no additional space um, other than what the space the house is taking up already. So that's solar energy. And again, from the engineering perspective, some really, really cool challenges there in terms of how do we make it cheaper? How do we make it more flexible? How can we come up with innovative ways of doing things like what that house has done? But that's only one step. Other things we have in Ireland, it's um, a really abundant source of a potential energy first, is the fact that we are surrounded by water. And if you ever go into the sea, you can feel the water hitting, you know that that energy is there, so how can we actually extract it? So one statistic is that there's up to about 525 terawatt hours of this type of energy available in Irish waters. So not worrying too much about what that means, more so 
about the fact that if we look at our 2018 electrical requirement, it's only about 30 terawatt hours. So you can see we have multiples more, again, of that energy um, available to us than we actually need. And actually, that was one statistic I missed on the previous slide, was that from a solar energy perspective, the sun delivers more energy in an hour than we need worldwide per year. So it's there. We just need to harness it. All right, so then if we look at what tidal energy is, tidal energy is something that we're, we're looking at the fact that we know the sea moves in and out. But can we harness the fact that it's moving to move it through a turbine? So here you can see we have water, we have turbines underneath. We can see that we know the water is going to move out. So why don't we put a turbine in between and harness some of that motion to actually turn a turbine and create electrical energy? Another way of doing this wave energy, and what wave energy does, is it basically allows us to use the fact that the, the sea is moving up and down all the time. And the way we do that is we take these kind of cylindrical objects, we put them in the sea, and basically we know that as the sea is moving, the wave energy is coming up and down, it causes this kind of compression between the cylindrical objects. And every time we compress something, that we can use that to generate electricity out the other side. So it's the connection between those cylindrical objects is causing a compression to take place all of the time as the waves move up and down. And again, that allows us to enhance that wave energy. So again, this is a more of maybe an emerging technology in comparison to solar, but again, really huge opportunity, especially for us in Ireland. So from an engineering perspective, there is no end to what you could be doing here in terms of trying to advance this type of technology. Wind energy, again, we, we're all very aware of wind energy. Again, it's probably most, our more, one of our, our most abundant ones in Ireland that we see, well established. I suppose from an engineering perspective, one of the challenges is that there is a certain objection to having this near people's houses, and that's completely understandable. Um, so how do we overcome that from an engineering perspective? And one of the ways that they're looking at doing that at the moment is obviously to move them offshore, because if we move them completely out into the sea, away from where anyone lives, it doesn't completely eliminate the problem, but it vastly reduces it. So one of the big challenges is can we make offshore turbines economically feasible? Because they still work out there. We know wind turbines work. We are happy with the technology. The problem is getting them out there and getting them out there in such a way that it doesn't cost us money because ultimately these solutions can't cost money. They have to be economically feasible. Um, so one of the huge challenges in wind energy at the moment is how can we make that that kind of situation like I have in the diagram there, economically feasible. And that is hard. It is hard to get those materials out there. It's hard to maintain those turbines when they're out there. And of course, we have to get all the electricity back to the mainland as well. So it shows that even with established technology such as wind energy, a really, really big engineering challenges still remain. But the focus of my talk isn't um, maybe so much around the source of electricity because again, they're such huge topics themselves. My main question is, in sl on the slide on solar energy, we said that we had more of an hour than we need for, uh, for the year for the world from solar. And um, we said for uh, the Irish uh, situation with wave and tidal, we had multiples more than we needed as well. So why are we not powered by renewable energy? What, what's the problem here? Why are we still digging stuff up from the ground, which we know is causing problems? And ultimately, the answer comes down to supply and demand, right? And this is the, the issue with supply and demand is the fact that we cannot guarantee at what time of the day the wind will blow, and we cannot guarantee that that time when the wind energy will be available for us will be the exact time that we need to power our cooker or our microwave or whatever it happens to be. So you can see on the graph here, you can see that in the middle of the day, we might have a, an, a, an excess, if you like, too much uh, solar energy because it's nice and sunny and we're all outside. But then you can see that the red line kind of shows that we actually only need all that energy then later on when we all come back inside, it's 10 o'clock at night, TVs are on, hair dryers are on, etc. That's when you need your energy. And the problem is, it's no good saying, well, it was sunny early, we had loads of energy in the middle of the day, but we can't use it now because ultimately you need it now. And this can be seasonal as well. If you look at solar energy, you can say, well, we have more solar energy in the longer days in summer, but actually we probably need more energy in the in the kind of shorter days in the winter because everyone's inside and the heating's on, we need loads of electricity. So it can be during the day and it can also be seasonal. Big, big problem in the fact that we cannot completely match when we need the energy to when we have the energy. All right, so well then, my most natural thing, if I have something at one o'clock and I need it at 10 o'clock, can I just save it at one and use it at 10? And that's the problem, okay? That's the challenge here that we're trying to address, right? So the challenge is, is that basically energy is not physical. We can't put it somewhere and just take it back. Ultimately, we have to come up with a more, a more innovative way of storing it. And again, the problem is that we're ultimately looking to store something which you can't see, you can't touch, you can't feel. So it's kind of like it's a substance that we know is there, but how do we store it? How do we get our hands on it? 
Okay, so there's a couple of different ways of doing it. So ultimately, you store energy every single day in your bag. Or your phone stores energy. It's, it's an energy storage device. You plug it in the morning and you use it all day. So a phone uh, is a great example of what we get used to doing without maybe quite thinking to what, what it is actually doing. So here we could say, well, okay, well, that's perfect. Well, I'm just going to create a large lithium-ion battery, and that's going to store all the energy that's created at 1 o'clock so I can use it at 10 o'clock. That does work. It has been done, and it is being done. The problem with it is that sometimes something that works on a really small scale doesn't work on a larger scale. So again, it's economically viable to buy a phone for uh, to buy a battery for your phone. Would you think it's economically viable to buy a battery for Ireland? Just picture how much it costs you to buy a battery for your phone and extrapolate that up to the amount of energy that would be needed to power the entire of Ireland, entirety of Ireland, and get it through a long, dark winter with the energy that was generated through the longer days in the summer. And you can see that you're quickly, quickly moving out of uh, any sort of economic feasibility uh, places. So batteries are continuing to be improved, and the challenge there is coming up with alternative ways. So uh, yes, of course, improving the lithium ion battery that's there, but also there's different ways of doing it, whether they're coming up with flow batteries and different kind of ways of doing it, which are trying to reinvent that technology. But ultimately, the main issue to overcome with batteries is the fact that first they can use some uh, precious metals, but also secondly, the fact that they are quite expensive. We're all used to this idea of a hydroelectric dam, right? A hydroelectric dam is ultimately energy storage as well, because what happens is we have energy up at a high level, and then as required, we can let it flow from that really high level down through a turbine. And as it accelerates through that turbine, from after dropping from that height, it turns a turbine and produces electricity. So pumped hydro, so hydro, uh, hydro storage like this is a form of really well established energy storage. Um, and what I suppose we need to do is we need to take that technology then and we can see how, how can we adapt it to turn it into something that we can turn on and turn off as we require it. And one way of turning on and turning it off is what's called pumped hydro storage. So again, here we're saying take something like, um, take a high mountain or reservoir, right? And when you have that energy at one o'clock in the day, what you can do is you can take water from the sea, you can use a pump, use all that excess energy which you have, pump it up to a really high level, store it at that high level, and leave it up there. Just put in that big reservoir up top. And then at 10 o'clock at night, when you need the energy, flip the direction, open a valve, and let it flow from that high direction down back into the sea again, and let it accelerate through a turbine. And by accelerating through the turbine, you're going to reproduce the energy once more. So again, by doing this, what we're doing is we're putting energy in when we have too much, we're pumping up to the high level. And then when we have it at the high level, we can decide when we need to use it and we can let it drop down again. So we're storing that energy. Really well established, really well used. The reason this isn't the ultimate solution for us is because we need to have specific high locations like that that we can completely fill with water. We need these big reservoirs up high and we've pretty much exhausted a lot of these already so the capacity isn't quite there to make this the sole solution to our energy problems a really good solution just can't quite be the full one because we don't have enough physical locations okay well you say oh, that's perfect and then another way you can say is well let's take this idea that you put in energy when you have it and you want to take it out when you need it another way is our poor gentleman here on the left hand side you can see he's pumping this tire he's putting in loads of energy if someone came along and burst that tire, all that energy would come shoot, all that air would come shooting out. So that's the energy uh, leaving once more. Okay, so what if we could develop a system to do that? So let's take our pumped hydro idea that we had and let's develop it to kind of bring it in with what our gentleman here is doing. So this is called compressed air energy storage. Now, so this is where, where we say, okay, now we have excess energy here on the, uh, in air that's been produced on the left-hand side by our windmill at the time at one o'clock in the day. We want to store it so we can use it at 10 o'clock at night. And one way of doing it is to basically use a compressor or pump to take air, to take the excess electricity that we have, pump this air up to a really, really high pressure. We pump it down into a big underground cavern. So we have this huge reservoir of really, really high, and a high pressure air down here. And then when we need it at 10 o'clock at night, we just crack a valve in that high pressure cavern, let the high pressure air shoot out through a turbine, turn the turbine and reproduce our electricity first. So what that does again, it allows us to turn on and turn off our electricity usage. So we, when we have too much energy, we use it to pump all our air into the high pressure cavern. And when we need it again, we just let it flow out and that flow of high pressure air out 
uh, similar to what we had here in our diagram, you could feel it flowing out, it would turn the turbine. So again, good solution. It allows us to be a lot more, um, it allows us to be a lot more proactive in terms of how we control it, but we uh, can't ultimately at this stage make it our ultimate solution again because we still need these really high pressures. Okay, so then I suppose the next, sorry, my screen here. So then the last one I'm just gonna quickly talk about here is this idea of hydrogen energy storage. So the idea of hydrogen energy storage, again, we could talk for days on this, but the idea here is again that you use electricity to split water using electrolysis. So again, at one o'clock in the day, when you have excess electricity available to you, you pump it in here into our system, right? And this is our basic electrolysis system that we would have used in, in school. And basically what it does is it allows that electricity flowing through our anode and our cathode splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. And what that means is that again, when our hydrogen and oxygen has been created like this, we can store hydrogen separately to where we store oxygen and we can leave them there for as long as we want. And then again, when we come back at 10 o'clock that night, what we can do is we can combine the oxygen and hydrogen together and combining oxygen and hydrogen together is essentially burning hydrogen. That's what that's what that is. It's you burn hydrogen and oxygen together and that reproduces water. So it's a perfect cycle. You take water, you use electricity to split it into hydrogen and oxygen, then you have hydrogen and oxygen, you burn them together to reproduce water. And that allows us to essentially store our energy, create the gases when we have too much, and reproduce our energy later on when we need to, when we need to use it. And again, this is a well-established science but the technology for actually storing energy with it is um, still very much developing. And I suppose the reason for that is due to the fact that it can potentially be extremely dangerous because you have hydrogen and oxygen, large volumes of gases that when combined could be hugely, hugely combustible and could lead to really, really large um, accidents. And that's the main challenge here. See how do we make this safer? How do we stop us having to uh, store these huge volumes of gases, and there's a huge amount of work going on to see how can we bind the, the gases into different kind of molecules so that they're no longer gaseous, but they're maybe solids, um, and ultimately how can we use and store these safely so that we can actually create commercializable equipment from them. So that's, I suppose, the kind of the overview of kind of maybe some of the technology that I just wanted to talk about, really only scratching the surface here in terms of what can be done and what, uh, what's out there. But I suppose I just wanted to kind of demonstrate that like this is a never ending challenge from an engineering perspective. We haven't cracked it yet. We're still using fossil fuels. We need to be intuitive. We need to be inventive, if you like, in terms of how we store renewable energy because it's not easy. But if we don't store it, we'll never be able to come, become completely reliant on it because ultimately in the middle of the night, there will never be sunshine. So we need a way of storing energy when we have it to when we need it. And we need really good engineers coming up with really innovative um, solutions and improving upon what we have there and coming up with new ones in order to allow us to get there. So look, I hope this was um, of some interest to you. Um, as I said, there's a lot more detail where this came from. This is just a, an introductory lecture and I look forward to any questions that do, uh, do come away afterwards. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Philip. That's really, really interesting. Um, so I'm going to queue up the next one now and I'll show you the results of our, our poll also. Um, if you just give me one minute. So poll-wise, um, I'm going to end the poll. Um, we had the majority of students who are interested in mechanical engineering. So 24% of those um, on with us today are mechanical engineering fans. Uh, then we have 22% who uh, aren't sure yet, and that's fine. Um, as I said in the, the talk earlier, our first year is a common entry um, and common engineering year, so people don't have to figure out what they want to specialise in right away. So for 22% at this stage to, to not know what they'd like to specialise in is, is perfectly understandable and um, probably expected. Then we have um, electrical engineering then be the, the second most popular of the disciplines that we offer, which is great. So next up, we're going to have a talk from uh, Dr. Colin Kyo, who's from our School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering, and his talk is about disruptive technology. So I'm going to queue that up for you now. Hello, my name is Colin. 
and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about engineering, disruptive technologies and that sort of stuff. Uh, a little about my background, how I ended up in engineering, uh, some of the work that I've been doing and kind of my journey from secondary school up to being a kind of practicing engineer right now. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about disruptive technology and loads of potential opportunities for you guys to work in if you choose engineering into the future. So a bit about me. So my background, my father was a car mechanic and he worked in a small little garage like this. So ever since I was a kid, I worked with him and I was exposed to technology and engineering and that sort of stuff. So from a very, very young, early age, I was interested in how things worked, how, thing, how to fix things, machinery and cars in particular were the thing that I really kind of loved and still do. So that was my connection into engineering. <laughs> So, you know, like an awful lot of kids, I was interested in Lego, in cars, in toy, in like Meccano, building toys, taking things apart, putting them back together. So this is me as I was a kid. So you see Lego blocks and cars. And this is me as an adult, which is basically the same thing. My Lego gets way more complicated and dangerous. And then the cars get way faster and way more fun. So about so my background so i went to ucd and i studied mechanical engineering for four years so i did four years mechanical engineering i then stayed on to do another year and i did an me in energy systems engineering so i was interested in automotive technology and then i pivoted into renewable energy so looking at electric vehicles biomass fuel solar panels that sort of stuff i then uh, stayed working in ucd as a research engineer for a good couple of years uh, working on R&D projects with companies. I started a few companies. I was involved in a couple of external projects. I acted as a consultant for a long, long time. And then I went back to UCD to do a PhD. So I finished my PhD and my PhD was in innovation systems and innovation methodologies. So I looked at since I worked in the field of innovation and I was creating new companies and new processes and new innovations and machines i wanted to look at how that works so i looked at methods like design thinking and lean six sigma and that sort of stuff we looked at how processes allow people to be more creative and more innovative and create the next generation of innovation so i finished that uh, just the beginning of this year and i got, I, I imagine i'm going to stay working in that field now for the foreseeable future so as I said, I worked in a consultant and as a researcher, so I worked on a large range of projects. So I like working on different projects all the time, so in different areas. So over the past few years, I've worked with like uh, incubators and business spin-out systems, helping startup companies create new technologies and develop new like solutions and then companies to go with them. I've worked on projects like in algae, which was using algae and like seaweed to create energy, plastic, food, fuel, anything and everything really you know i've done some projects with large car companies like fiat and that was integrating solar panels into the roofs of new fiat cars a lot of projects in sustainability renewable energy and applying new technology so in addition to private ones i've done an awful lot of research projects so i've started and ran projects looking at recycling plastic waste looking at connecting the community to waste in the environment and trying to find ways in which community can upgrade that and improve it so a wide range of projects and that suits me down to the ground like my projects change every couple of weeks i work in different areas in different countries with different pro professions and different backgrounds and i love that scope and variety and flexibility in different projects so as well as the research work i do an awful lot of private consultancy work so i work with universities and companies all around the world like airlines like air asia when we looked at imagining what the future of air travel would look like you know, I've taught and give lectures in places like Singapore and MIT in the US and then an awful lot of development. So things like United Nations development and uh, different universities around the world. I run workshops and work with them in their, the area of innovation, helping both their people that work for them, their staff and students and external people to be more creative and innovative in their specific areas. So we do workshops, we do a whole host of different things with a company that I run, uh, founded last year with a friend of mine called Sapien Innovation, and we do innovative work in there. So one of the main things I worked on over the years is when I was still in university, I started a nonprofit called the Rapid Foundation. And what that does is the Rapid Foundation, we started it a few years ago, and the idea was we had access to 3D printers, and we said these can do an awful lot of good in the world. So we looked at how we could use 3D printers to do overseas development work. So for the last couple of years, we've been sending 3D printers to developing regions around the world. Like these photographs are from 
Kenya and uh, rural India, Uganda. So we send technology, we teach people and kids there how to use it, and then we support them using 3D printers to make the things they need. So it could be educational tools, could be maps of India, it could be low cost medical devices like these wrist braces, anything and everything we help them do. It. And then similarly, we do the same here in Ireland. So we go to technology events and like large kind of public events like Dublin Maker Fair, environmental kind of sustainability events. And we show people what you can do with 3D printing and how you can use innovation, 3D printing, creativity and engineering to solve global problems like plastic waste or access to information and materials. You know, and then, you know, they're very engaging. Our stuff is really engaging. We do workshops with kids. We do workshops with large corporations. So one day we could be doing a workshop with this guy here and helping him build little mo uh, model prosthetic hands so he can relate to another kid of his age that needs to use a prosthetic. And the day after that, we could be doing a workshop with CEOs of large corporations. So again, wide range of scope, but I like to get all ends of the spectrum and it make, keeps it interesting and keeps it varied. So one of the best things I've worked on in the past so far has been this. So for a long, long time, we were manufacturing 3D printed prosthetic hands here. You know, this is me fitting one to a little girl, Ella. She was only six. She was born without any fingers on her right hand. And it meant she couldn't use her arm. And it was she was she was kind of protecting it and keeping it away. So very, very quickly, I think it was in eight hours. And for like 10 or 20 euros, we were able to 3D print her a prosthetic hand and give her some function back into that hand. And then, you know, using a, a small amount of time a small amount of money and a consumer 3d printer like you'd have in a library or having a school we were able to make these 3d printed prosthetics and make a big difference to her life and her family so that journey brought me on a convoluted path and with work like that having such a big impact on people around the world resulted in us winning me and my co-founder winning an awful lot of awards so things like research awards outstanding people and them um, these awards were great because they helped us promote the work we were doing, but also gave me access to great opportunities and opportunities I could never have imagined. And particularly as an engineer, stuff you'd never assume an engineer would ever be able to get involved in. So, example, I was on the Forbes Under 30 list one year, and that's resulted in a load of different interested experiences. I get to go to their conferences every year. There's a conference, hopefully I can get to COVID dependent this year in... Um, Botswana in Africa in December. So, you know, we get to travel, we get to work with company CEOs, co-founders and meet really interesting people and create new interesting projects. Uh, I was also a, a brand ambassador for Nissan for two years and uh, they supported the charity and, you know, they provided a great help and with technology and we worked on some technology projects. This was doing some mapping with drones along the west coast of Ireland where we were trying to create 3D models of the coast in Ireland. I got to meet some really interesting people. The guy in the pink shirt is one of the co-founders of Reddit. And then Chris Hatfield, the astronaut. You know, it's we get to have conversations. I talked to Chris for about an hour about old American muscle cars. You know, you get to connect and have really good, interesting experiences. He was a mechanical engineer. So was I. We got on really well over a shared love of engineering. So it was great opportunities and great experiences. I had an opportunity to do a TED Talk here in UCD a few years ago about um, open innovation and innovation being available and open to everybody and even now the way i do my workshops is not normal they're very open as you can see there's no suits there's no toys there's nobody sitting in an office they're all very bright and colorful and engaging different ages different kind of people from different backgrounds i like running these kind of really fluid interesting open engagements so during covid as well so this innovation potential means that I was able to pivot into new ideas. And probably about two months ago to respond to COVID, I set up an organization called Open Source Ventilator. Uh, that then turned into a group called Team OSV. And what that was, was about six or 7,000 people volunteered online in the space of a week who all wanted to contribute and create things to help support innovation. So first of all, we were looking at manufacturing ventilators, 3D, 3D printed cheap ventilators. And then secondary to that, uh, we started looking at other things. So things like face shields, face masks, education materials. So over the course of the last month, we've manufactured an awful lot of things, got involved in creating very, very complex structures and systems, and then things like this. So these are just a small sample of some of the ventilator concepts we've managed to develop. We went through 15 concepts, and two of them now have very high potential. Thankfully, they're not needed now at the minute, but they will be needed again in the future. So development will keep going. And be online very, very quickly, we were able to make, you know, all of these innovation and potential. 
So that was a very disruptive action in itself. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is disruptive innovation. So the term disruptive innovation is an innovation that creates a brand new market and brand new value that wasn't there before. So things that quickly disrupt markets. So for a very basic example, the invention of the car disrupted the horse industry or the horse, tra horse and cart industry, that sort of stuff. The invention of the internet, you know, you could argue replaces is slowly starting to replace television, that sort of stuff. So it's new inventions to come along and completely change how society does things or how industry does things in particular. So there's a huge whole host of these and you're very lucky to live in the time in which there's so much technology and there's new technology coming every single day. So on this graph here, this is um the second horizon. So this is a horizon of disruptive technology. So these are the things that are very, very likely to completely change how we live on the now in the medium term and on the longer term. So things like precise manufacturing, digital currencies, augmented reality, these things present huge opportunities. And if you go on to study engineering, it wouldn't surprise me if you end up working in these fields that currently are very small or don't exist at all. And then you could be leaders in that field and help create the new industry and the new normal, all using this idea of innovation and creating new. So what I'm gonna do is give you a couple of hints, give you a couple of kind of indicators on what sort of stuff is going to be very important in you for you guys when you go forward and then you know hopefully you'll get some ideas and you might be interested in working in that field in general so one of the things is blockchain so everyone's heard of bitcoin and cryptocurrency blockchain's basically like a digital a digital record book that records transactions so blockchain is going to be super super useful and it's going to be one of the core elements of like data security internet security financial security in the future it's a book it's basically like a, a log which tracks all of the transactions that go on in it so for security for traceability for trackability it's excellent so blockchain is a great idea but it hasn't been fully applied to financial services or social media or anything yet so there's huge potential opportunities in here for you guys to work on and develop and kind of create the new kind of base for transactions in the world and then similarly to that is mobile banking. So traditionally a bank, you'd go in, you'd fill out a slip, you'd give them the money, it'd be lodged into your bank account and vice versa. Whereas now most people have a Revolut card. Go to the US, most people use Venmo to digitally send each other money via their phones. And then if you go to a place like China, people pay for everything with their phone. You contactless tap your phone, which has your bank account on it and you pay for things. So this idea of mobile banking, like me personally, I've not been inside the door of a bank for about three years. Everything is done via online banking or with my Revolut card. That's exactly how you work. And there's huge opportunities in changing the traditional banking system into this new banking system for you guys and us to use the, with this like mobile banking infrastructure. Similarly, fintech. So fintech is this idea of financial technology. So again, the financial world is quite old school, but brand new ideas, digital storage, online share portfolios, being able to buy options and trade on your mobile phone, you know, applications to help you save your money, to track your money, that sort of stuff. Fintech is going to be huge as technology further connects itself in the field of finance and how it's going to relate to companies and into daily life. Similarly, the idea of social commerce is very, very interesting and is going to become way more popular so on a base level things like done deal that's social commerce one normal person selling something else to somebody else but if you go to another country an awful lot of countries in africa you know wechat in china or whatsapp in africa these are communication platforms but they're doing sales through them so one of the biggest supply one of the biggest marketplaces in all of africa is whatsapp people creating these community shared groups and posting up something for sale in a WhatsApp group chat with 10,000 people in it. And then somebody saying, I love that, I'll buy it. So social commerce, new platforms, new opportunities is gonna be very, very interesting and cause an awful lot of trouble for both online commerce and then normal stores and shops. Then similarly, real estate. You know, if you take COVID now, if you wanna buy a house, you can't get in and view it because it's unsafe. So people are doing like video call viewings that's gonna have to, that's gonna probably become way more popular. And the process of buying a house, you probably wanna buy it online. I buy most of my things online. If I can afford it, I can't see why I wouldn't buy a house online, but there's systems that need to change and architectures and new opportunities and new companies that need to improve so this can happen. Then similarly, remote working. So everyone has heard about WeWork and these satellite offices. 
they're very, very, very of the moment now because nobody knows whether you should be working in an office anymore. And the majority of the world is working from home now. So there's going to be huge new opportunities making working from home as good as it could be, improving it, creating new systems, helping people connect and relax and feel part of a team while being separate from each other. So there's huge opportunities in that. And again, live sports. So again, at the minute, live sports aren't r- running. You can't go and view it because of Corona. But even in the future, will people want to? So esports, things like Twitch and, you know, whether you're streaming Call of Duty online, that is becoming as popular as the Premier League. So there's huge opportunities here in new sports, new ideas and remote kind of sports streaming online. Then you're probably at the right age to see the first kind of commercialized space travel. So Elon Musk, Dragon, SpaceX, people that are going to try and start colonizing on our planets, you know, more efficient, more regular transport to the moon or Elon Musk trying to put people on Mars. This colonization brings whole new problems, but also whole new opportunities, new things that you guys can work in. And engineering is going to explode in this space sector over the next couple of years. And it's really kind of exciting. And then on a more kind of localized level, water rights and distribution is going to be very important. Water is the most useful, important commodity in the world. Super valuable, super important, but not everyone has access to it. So the technology in cleaning the water, in sourcing the water, making sure it's distributed quickly, making sure there's new water systems created for places like Africa and the Middle East, which is very hot, have a lack of water. So there's huge amounts of opportunity in here. And water is going to become one of the most valuable commodities in the future because everyone needs it. And then how that's delivered is also a problem. We create so much waste, waste plastic, waste packaging, waste waste in general. So we've generated all of this. What do we do with it now? Is it recycled? Do we break it down? Do we turn it into new plastic and use it again? There's huge amounts of opportunity in packaging. So there's lots of issues in there. And that's probably one of the growing fields in engineering. If you guys study it in the future, it's what we do with the waste, how we recycle it, and how we become more efficient using materials. Food and nutrition is very important. So, you know, farming is very intensive on the environment, land intensive, water intensive, emission intensive. So things like Impossible Burgers, you know, meatless meat, or companies like Neuritas who use computer science to find useful, uh, you know, um, nutrients in food. And then the issues with solving and feeding the third world. So things like Plumpy Nut, nut butter, peanut butter, high quality, high protein and high kind of calorie stuff to feed the growing number of hungry people in the world. And then related to that is agronomy. So this is insect farming. So, you know, protein is hard. Cows are expensive. Insect farming is going to become more and more popular. I've eaten them before. They taste fine with chili sauce on them. So you'd be grand. You know, so growing and the large culturing of farm uh, insects for food and protein is going to become way more popular and important. So there's lots of issues there. And then, of course, energy and sanitation, particularly now. More of the world needs energy. We need renewable energy. We need solar energy. And more people need sanitation, toilets, hand washing, that sort of stuff to keep them safe during global pandemics, but even just beforehand. So more people in the world die from poor sanitation than have ever died of COVID or any form of other infectious disease. It is a big world problem and it's a problem and a challenge that needs to kind of be solved. So what other ideas do you have? Have a think about them. What is the new fields that are going to happen? What is the new interest in the new areas you would like to work on? And where do you think your career is going to go in the future? So that's a quick little taste of my background of some of the areas I'm going to be looking at and some of the fields I think you guys are going to look at in the future. So I hope you're enjoying your little taste of engineering and I hope to see us all as engineers again in the future soon. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for Colin for recording that video for us. I think it was really interesting um, and I hope you found uh, the same. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule so we're going to get our Q&A uh, started with our current students. I'm just going to get them online with us. So we have Connor who is just I think finished his fourth year of the Structural Engineering with Architecture program and we're also going to have uh, Neve O'Connell, who has finished her, I think, third year of chemical and bioprocess engineering. And then we're also going to be joined by my colleague Katie O'Neill, um, who is the marketing manager for College of Engineering, along with myself, and she's going to be there to ask, uh, answer any questions that you might have as well. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. 
Um, so if people want to start putting their questions in the Q&A uh, button at the bottom there, we have some in and I was also sent some in um, advance as well. So we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, so let's have a look. So one of the questions we got in advance was uh, for both of our students, what made you decide to do engineering um, when you were filling in the, the CAO system? Connor, you can go first. I'll go first. Or, okay. Or... <laughs> um, so yeah, so in school myself, I really liked maths and physics. Um, when I was choosing my subjects back in TY, I was kind of picking them broadly. So I still did like geography and business, but coming towards the Leaving Cert, through studying the Leaving Cert, I realized I just really enjoyed, you know, physics and maths and the problem solving side of it. I was good at art as well but I didn't do art for the leaving stuff, but I kind of enjoyed the idea of, you know, drawing things, art and physics. And so I just kind of went for engineering and haven't looked back since really. And then for me, it was kind of the same. I enjoyed physics. I also did chemistry for leaving cert and obviously honors maths as well. And I kind of, I knew I liked science. I knew I liked maths. So I spent a lot of time looking into either general science or engineering and in the end I decided to do engineering and then UCD in particular because I offered the general first year that was a big driver for me. I always kind of thought chemical engineering because I liked chemistry but I didn't want to be limited, that, limited to that so I thought UCD was the best option. Keep it as general as possible because even within the mainstreams you can go on and go into a wide wide range of different um, industries afterwards so I felt I wasn't limiting myself in any way by choosing engineering. Okay, thanks. Um, and so far, um, I know you are a couple of years into your degree at the moment. What's been your favorite part of doing an engineering degree so far? Um, well, for myself, I'm actually on my workplace fourth year at the moment. So I'm working in Edinburgh as a bridge engineer. And like before this, before that, I've never really worked as an engineer. I've just studied. So it has definitely been a highlight of mine, but I also, I've enjoyed it really, like I've enjoyed it so much because of how much understanding and learning I've had in engineering in UCD, like that was one of the things I was a little bit scared of coming to Scotland and stuff. Um, but so yeah, I do really enjoy the work placement. I also enjoy the kind of group project um, modules in UCD. They kind of set you up for working in an engineering team. For example, there's nine people on my bridge engineering team at the moment and we're constantly changing work. I'm um, getting people to cover other aspects of projects. So it kind of used to do replicate that quite well in group projects. That's one element I really liked. Yeah, you mentioned the group work. So it's something I found coming to UCD. So I came from Kerry, so I actually didn't know very many people up here. And engineering is actually a really great subject for that because it's quite um, hour intensive. You've quite a lot of hours, but it means you get to spend these hours with your classes. So this is a big class in your first year. You, I think it's a year of almost 300 people, but because you spend so much time with these people and you have labs with them, you get to know them really quickly and you can form quite strong bonds quickly. And then going into your stream, it'll be slightly smaller. And again, you spend a lot of time together. You do a lot of group projects. So it's really working together working with people and also you might start with something vague and you're given okay you need to design this and then it's I really enjoyed working as a team working on different people's strengths to come up with your final solution it's been very that's the most rewarding part and enjoyable for me Right, thank you. Um, and then, uh, Katie, just in relation to um, leaving certain subjects, students are, are choosing maybe when they're heading into fifth year. And um, someone's asking about things like physics and applied maths. Do you think they're useful students or subjects for students to choose? Were you asking me there, Laura? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as as you outlined at the beginning, we do look for just one honors science subject. Um, and sometimes students get a little bit stressed over the facts that maybe they've got physics, but they maybe don't have the chemistry or vice versa. What I'd say to students is it's really useful, obviously, if you have more than one uh, science subject, because obviously engineering is very maths and science based. However, first year is very much about bringing everybody up to the same level. So we do have students that come in with just the one and then they're really bringing their base up in first year. I don't know if Neve and Connor, perhaps, did you both come in with two science subjects or did either of you come in with one and how did you find that? Um, I just, I actually just came in with physics. Now I hadn't, 
like my school didn't really offer applied maths mainstream um so i just said physics but on that note i i know people in my year who i know a girl for example who did chemistry and she's so she didn't do physics higher applied maths or she didn't do um biology and she's now doing biomedical engineering um so it's just about as katie said kind of putting your head at the start no one's going to have done everything like to really high level so everyone has to kind of put their head down and learn maybe what they're less experienced in and then ECD is quite good at catching everyone up to the same standard and then going on from the leading search um, in each subject. So it definitely, once you cover the basics, so as Katie said, one science subject, it's possible to do whichever stream, you're not, not limited to in any stream or anything. Um, you just might need to put your head down for that one subject in particular. And then for me, I had physics and chemistry. So I had a bit of an advantage in the chemistry, but then I struggled a bit with mechanics, which was like applied, applied math. So I kind of put the extra energy into that subject and you kind of know you can, you definitely gain from having some experience, but the lectures are great. There's tutorials and also um, the people in your class will have different strengths. So they'll help you out if you, you can help them with studying for chemistry and they can help you with studying for the mechanics. It kind of works like that. Right, that's wonderful. And obviously a lot of students who are interested in engineering are wanting to do it because it's seen as a very practical degree. Um, how much practicality or how much kind of labs tutorials would you do as part of each of your various different disciplines? Yeah, so there, there are like a lot of practical elements. Um, for example, I do structural engineering and in Newstead where I study, there's a massive big workshop lab where you, where you make, so I think in my time I've made a table, I've made beams, I've made a kind of bicycle lock chair system um, and while you're not going to be doing practical stuff all the time because um, you, you know you do learn a lot of theory but you're, it's all about applying theory that you do learn into practical elements. I think right from first year we made a crane out of household objects and the person who has the highest like the group has the highest ratio of weight of the crane to the amount of weight it can lift gets the top mark. So it is quite competitive in that aspect as well. It's not just for fun about kind of gluing stuff together, you know. So right from first year all the way to now, to your masters, they have practical elements running through the course. Yeah, like Connor said, it's kind of integrated in the course. And what's nice is it's a lot of, you'll learn your theory, for example, in third year now. So I did a lot of the theory um, in the first semester. And then this semester, I had two different lab modules. So we were able to apply what we'd learned the previous semester to real life and we actually for our labs this semester we were in Nybert which is uh, in the National Centre for um, Biopharmaceutical um, Development and Research and this is a really exciting place to be and um, for us to be able to have labs in a place like this is something that will really stand out going forward looking for jobs as well so it's not only that you have practical work in the college as well, but they might also bring you outside too. And we've been on site visits and things as well, which gives us a good experience of engineering outside UCD too. Right, and then for both of you, obviously UCD has a common first year. Do you find that's beneficial or would you like to specialize sooner? Um, or how did you change your mind from what you were thinking you would pursue uh, based on the common first year? Um, so I think it's definitely an advantage. Like. I know a lot of people that went in thinking they wanted to do, for example, chemistry and they ended up doing biomed. I know people that went in that wanted to do something and they ended up doing something. But it's also kind of a good, it's, it's good in the way it tells you what you don't want to do at the same time. So if you're between chemistry and biomed, for example, you might get more into one and put off another one. Or just if you went straight into chemistry and you for example, if UCD didn't do a general year and you were, you were kind of at the back of your mind always thinking about another stream, you'd never really know if it was for you or not. Um, and another, another thing, even after the first year of general lecturing, I know a lot of people in my year, they kind of would visit lectures of other streams just to make sure it's kind of the right decision. Um, so I think someone asked in, in the questions, can you change after second year? Like while it's not advised, there is some leeway in the first kind of month I'd say to chop and change um, and students that are interested in that will usually spend a lot of time going to both lectures just to get an idea. Yeah I think the first year or the 
common first year is what actually drew me to UCD because I went ahead and chose chemical, which was what I was thinking. But I never wanted, I think even in fourth year, you don't know which subjects to pick for your leaving sir. And then going on, it's so hard to know exactly what you want to do, what you want to work as. So I think giving yourself as much choice as possible the whole way through is only going to benefit you. And there's a lot of support in UCD to help you decide after first year. They run different talks and they give students perspectives on the different courses. So you kind of have an idea of what you're going into then. And you can make quite an informed decision. Um, the, you have option modules in the second semester, so you can pick a taster from the different streams to get a feel for it and see whether you like it or not. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, um, Katie, just um, for yourself, because I know um, you've been maybe uh, familiar with students, um, when they're choosing their um, options going into second year, is it free choice or is there constraint by, by numbers and things like that? So generally, it's free choice. Uh, they have a choice of six pathways, which I know you outlined um, earlier on in your presentation. So we've never really had an issue where someone has not got their choice. But I will put in the slight caveat that if all 300 students decided to choose chemical engineering, we absolutely facilitate that. That has never happened. Um, we take about 320 students into first year, and we haven't had an issue where we've had to turn students away from their preferred stream. As I say, if we had a freak year where 90% of students decided they all wanted to do mechanical, we may have to reassess. But as a general rule of thumb, it is a free choice, yes. Great. Um, and then Neve, just for yourself, particularly because you're a chemical and bioprocess engineering student, do you envisage when you finish um, that you are you know, a qualified chemical engineer and that you can go straight into industry or do you find that you, you might need a bit more training afterwards? No, um, my degree is extremely industry focused, which is a great benefit of it. And a lot of people don't know, but Ireland is absolutely huge for pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical. And that's um, where a lot of the area where Eric our course would focus on. So at the moment, it's a extremely exciting area to be in, as in with COVID-19, there's a lot of companies developing new vaccines. And with our degree, there's a lot of strong links with industry. And um, if we decide to do the five years, which is an integrated master's, we'll have a six to 12 month industry placement. And um, coming out of either the four year or the five year, you should be able to get into a job very easily and um, they're crying out for chemical engineers in Ireland at the moment and you've been trained to that standard to go into a job straight away. Great and then uh, Katie if I just ask you um, obviously for a lot of um, our female students who are wondering is engineering female friendly um, or how many you know if they're going to be in a class on their own as the only female student and um, could you speak to maybe some of the the ratios that we have of students coming in a first year? Sure, and I think, actually think that's a really good question because I know engineering traditionally in the past has been seen much more as a male-dominated industry. This is something that's very close to mine and Laura's heart and something that we've worked on consistently over the last number of years. Um, we have, last year, it was about 35% of first years coming into UC engineering were female. And that has been growing year on year over the last about 10 years. So we are delighted to see that it's been presented more as an opportunity and that it's been grabbed. So the portions are still not 50-50, but we're certainly moving in that direction. And um, Eve may want to add in terms of her experience, I know she's in third year where I think the first year ratio was more around uh, 25%, but as I say this year it was 35%, which we're very proud of. Yeah, to be honest, I've never felt um, that I was one of the few females in the room. I think there's even the girls that do come, we all want to be here and we all have quite a strong presence in all of the lectures and tutorials and stuff as well. We're not afraid to get involved, which is nice to see. And I've actually never once taken it into account um, or taken any notice of it, which is nice. And I feel just as, yeah, it feels like it is 50-50, even if it isn't, I've never taken any notice of it. That's really good to hear. I'll put some of our students' minds at ease if, if that's what they're worried about. Um, for students who are interested in the UCD Horizons program, uh, if you maybe want to talk about some of the, the maybe classes or modules you did outside engineering and maybe why you chose them or if they added anything to your engineering degree that you're doing. Yeah, so yeah, so if students don't know, UCD offer electives, so it's usually one elective per semester. 
that you get to do. So for myself in second year, I think I was, I did a lecture on, in psychology. Um, it was one that students recommended to me as just an interesting lecture. And I genuinely enjoyed it. It's a bit of a walk from the engineering building that I'm in, but it's just something different every week. And it just kind of gives you an, an out, like a further look, I suppose, on what other students are studying. And it, gives you, it lets you think differently. I think other, other modules I've done, I've done electives in relation to engineering. I've done geography electives, um, social science ones. And it's just a nice kind of change to, you know, maybe doing engineering for a whole day. Yeah, um, one I chose to do last year was Swahili. So through UCD, I got involved with their Volunteers Overseas Programme. So I went to Tanzania last summer for a month um, teaching computer skills to secondary school teachers. So I was able through the Horizons Programme to do a Swahili elective module. So then I was learning the language before I was going over and I was still getting academic credits for it. So it was great. It was really enjoyable. Like Connor said, it's something different to engineering, which is nice to have that alongside it. And if for, for it to count for something as well, is it's nice that that's recognized. That's wonderful. For students who are maybe concerned around um, the level of maths requirement coming into engineering because it is a big component is there a large jump from, say, leaving certain maths to maths that you do in engineering? Um, or is there any supports available to students who may be struggling with the maths? Um, it's not necessarily a large jump. It does, like for every subject, engineering does kind of, maybe for the first two or three weeks, recap on the end of the leaving cert. And then it, it just continues on progressively. Um, in terms of UCD, one thing I really found helpful was the Math Support Centre. So it's offered to all undergrad students. Um, and it's basically this room of PhD or master students that are interviewed and they're like, you know, made sure they're right for the job. And they just sit in this room for you to come in. You can book an appointment or you can come in without an appointment and they just help you with maths modules. Um, they don't do your homework for you. They're not gonna do an assignment for you, but they just help you understand and learn how to do the maths. Um, they're there for you to learn. So it's not like they're just rushing through it. Um, and it's really good. It's usually, they open at extended times during the exam season. So it really is a good facility for students in terms of the maths. And they do actually help with some physics areas as well. Yeah, me, I used the Math Support Centre a lot in first year um, because it's kind of a different style of teaching maths. The lectures are quite different, but then also it, what's really beneficial is the tutorials. So these would be a smaller class, kind of more traditional classroom size, around like 25, 30, with um, one or two tutors. So then that's a place for you to go and ask questions in person. And then again, if you still have trouble understanding it, I definitely use the Math Support Center a lot and it helped me because it, it can be a bit of change. It's kind of a change in the style of learning math. So to have the, the tutorials and the Math Support Center there is really helpful. Yeah, I think the lecturers are like people have sometimes difficulties with maths, but the lecturers are very good at listening to students and changing up their teaching styles if it suits the class more. And you have class reps that kind of usually get that communication across to the lecturers. So it is a kind of two way thing, even though there might be 300 people in the lecture. And, and then, Connor, just um, some of the students were asking about work placement. Um, could you maybe tell us a bit about how you secured your work placement or maybe um, how that process kind of works? Yeah, so at the start of fourth year, um, UCD email you out just the kind of instructions of how to apply for work placements. Um, they kind of give you tips to like start updating your CV. They run workshop classes that you're, it's suggested that you attend. They just teach you how to do a CV, how to practice for an interview. There's also the UCD Career Guidance Centre that help you do mock interviews um, and CV prep. And then in terms of the actual application for placement, UCD hosts a lot of companies through the UCD's website. And so you can apply to as many as you want. Uh, I think I had about, I think it was about 17 or 18 that are, I suppose, related to UCD and that they're kind of offering jobs for the placement but as well as that you can apply at your own free will to external companies so for my example i applied to a company called acom in edinburgh and that was outside of ucd but the ucd course is internationally recognized it's very strong so they had no problem trusting that 
I was capable and it just took a few emails to confirm that they existed and that I was actually going to a company um, and then UCD kind of signed off on it. So it is, it's run quite smoothly. Um, and a lot of the companies are quite good. They give you, uh, most companies like gave interviews to a lot of people. So even if you don't want to go to that company, you get a practice interview in a real office, you know, somewhere in Dublin. So it is, it's a really good experience. Right. And then obviously someone was asking, is it a paid placement? Um, and while we say it, it, we can't guarantee it is a paid placement, but the majority of companies uh, really value the, the students that they get and really value the fact that they, you know, they can bring students um, to yeah. be paid. Pay. Yeah, they, like, as you said, it's not guaranteed paid, but anyone I know has been paid. Um, even through coronavirus, I'm still working from home, getting paid. Um, so it's, yeah, they definitely want to keep you interested. And because a lot of, there's more companies than students usually with placement positions. So they want you to come back as a graduate. So, yeah. Great. And then we also, just got some. I, oh, yeah. Go I might just say there's also room for summer internships. So I have uh, I was with Sanofi in Waterford last summer and I'll be working from home with them again this summer. And a lot of my friends have done internships, whether with consultancy firms or on sites, different places. So even in second and third year, those summers, you could be looking to get a summer student placement somewhere as well and those um, a lot of those are paid as well so there's plenty of opportunities to get different experience and see which areas you're particularly interested in. Great um, and then Katie we have a couple of questions um, from students who are maybe asking more specifically around um, aeronautical engineering and we've also got questions before from students about automotive engineering and um, maybe you could speak to you know why UC doesn't offer that or maybe the advantages of just um, doing maybe the mechanical engineering degree first. Yeah so that's a question we get every now and now and then uh, when we speak to mechanical engineers or we speak to professors uh, in mechanical engineering what they always say to us is they would actually advise students to do mechanical engineering before specializing into aeronautical because aeronautical is more of a subset of mechanical engineering. Um, so what we have had happen previously is students doing mechanical engineer, engineering at bachelor's level and then progressing to do a master's in aeronautical engineering in other universities, such as Cranford University. In saying that we've had students go through uh, and do their master's in mechanical engineering and still working in that industry. So they do say the best advice is mechanical engineering before you specialize because then you're not just uh, put into one particular area. Great. Um, and then we've just had a question around kind of what the exams are like and obviously for students coming from second level, educa level education it'd be slightly different format than they're used to. Um, do you find that the exams are stressful or difficult or how do you, how do you find them? Um, so in terms of the physical setting if students don't know they're set in the RDS um, with certain circumstances, circumstances you can sit them in UCD. So it is a bigger hall to what you're used to. There's more chairs and people sometimes think that's intimidating. But once you get down on the desk and you have your head down, it's, just, it's the same as being in a classroom at school, you know. Um, the exams are typically similar to leaving certain that they're two hours long. You have like days, if not lots of time between exams. So you have time to study between them. Um, so they are like, well, while there are a sim different setting, they are similar in that, you know, it's just about studying and answering questions that you can answer and going in on time and doing the exam. Yeah, I'd agree with Connor. It's, yeah, it's in a bigger room, but it's not that dissimilar from the Leaving Cert. Um, and then obviously this semester I've had at home exams, there was no um, physical exams. So this is a different experience, but I must say the lecturers have been extremely, extremely helpful at dealing with this and coming up with solutions that will fit everyone. So it was different doing your exam at home, but we still had our two hours and then you would just upload it as usual. So it was kind of the same setup again. Um, a little bit more intimidating the first time, but once you've done it once, it's the exact same. Great. Um, I'm just going to put questions in around the new sustainability program that we're um, offering in UCD. Now, I will say that the program is actually managed and kind of run by our UCD College of Science. 
Um, and I know that they have done a recent webinar on that. So I'm going to, um, rather than giving you misinformation, maybe um, I'll send a link around to the webinar that they've done on that and some contact details for that particular um, program, because I know we got a couple of questions on it. Um, and I know we've run over time a little bit, so I'll ask, answer one more question maybe, um, and then I'll tell you about how to enter our competition um, and we'll wrap it up there. So we've got one question around, um, uh, obviously more subject requirements and um, but Katie if someone has an exemption from um, Irish um, is that okay and can they just replace that with another subject? Yeah so Irish is a requirement unless you have an exemption so if you have an exemption for Irish we will be not we will not be looking for it as an entry requirement to UCD engineering so you just take your combination of your best six subjects making sure you've got the honours maths and the honours science the minimum requirements set out for that. Great um, so I think we'll finish our Q&A session there. I just want to say a really big thank you to you all for participating. Uh, we got through a lot of questions there and hopefully most of them um, were answered. I'll follow up with um, our attendees today with questions that we didn't get answered and to some useful links that they might find beneficial. Um, and then just because everyone who waited to the end deserves um, to maybe to be with a chance to win a prize, we are running a competition over on our Instagram page. It's just UCD Eng Arc. Um, over on Instagram. So all you have to do is give us a follow and then there is a post about today's webinar, the UCD Engineering Your Future at Home um, series. Uh, I think it's second on the grid. So just give that a like as well. And then I'll randomly choose a winner tomorrow um, and I'll be in touch with how you can claim your prize. And it's just a UCD goodie bag. Um, it's got a, a really nice engineering and architecture hoodie and it also got a Just Eat voucher as well. So head over to our Instagram and give us a follow and a like on our post and you're in with a chance to win. Um, thank you all for participating today and um, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Bye.